Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is commercial real estate investment expert, CJ Fellini. Now, CJ is the managing principal of Noyak Logistics, a public real estate investment trust that specializes in American logistics real estate infrastructure with a with core values based on the continue growth of e-commerce. Now, CJ's experience spans more than 38 years as a leading investment expert on alternative investment real estate, including healthcare, cold storage logistics, venture capital, media infrastructure, and qualified opportunity zone development. So guys, I'm excited to get onto it here with CJ, but before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items to run through. Uh, as I've mentioned in the last couple of shows, I've uh, just been giving out a free copy of my most recently released book, The Cash Flow Investor. It is for sale on Amazon for $20, but if you'd like to save yourself 20 bucks, you can go over to kevinbupp.com forward slash free book to grab your free copy. Again, that's kevinbupp.com forward slash free book. And you can grab that free copy there and it's the entire copy. It's not like a little, a little teaser. You can get the entire thing right there. Um, uh, last thing here, guys, I want to me make mention of you. If you're an accredited investor has an interest in partnering with, with me and my team, uh, head over to investwithsunrise.com. You can learn about partnering uh, on current deals that we have in the pipe, but also deals that, that, that we've always closed on that are already, you know, passing out cash flow and, you know, on a quarterly basis. Um, again, not only do we have a, a stout pipeline of, of active deals, uh, but our current offering SCI growth and income fund three currently has over 20 million of sweat equity that we've built since its inception, just about a year and a half ago. And um, the opportunity is limited here. Uh, we're going to be closing this out here in the next couple of months. So if you want to invest in deals again, that are already cash flowing and providing quarterly distributions, head on over to investwithsignrise.com. And just one last note to mention here. Um, 2022 is the last year that you'll be able to get 100% of the bonus depreciation benefits before uh, this incentive starts scaling back starting in 2023. And so uh, if you guys don't know, again, we're in the manufactured housing space. Uh, mobile home parks are incredibly tax efficient. So again, go check out our current offering at investwithsunrise.com. And so with that, guys, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show, CJ Fellini. CJ, how are you doing today, my friend? Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. Excited to have you here. And just to give our listeners a sense of uh, geographical uh, uh, nature of where you're located, uh, where, where are you based at today? Uh, today, I'm in Southampton, which is the east end of uh, Long Island, New York. Uh, we also have an office in New York City. Okay, fantastic. And uh, what I always like to do here, CJ, is, you know, I gave a very, very brief introduction of you and your, and your background. You've been at this now for, for more than 38 years. And so what I prefer to do is pass it back to you. And in your own words, maybe give us a little bit of a, a sense of of how you got started in this industry and, and ultimately what it is you guys do today. Great. Well, thank you. I will. Uh, so I am a first generation immigrant. My, my parents are both uh, immigrants from Italy and uh, my father, a highly decorated NYFD uh, uh, until uh, he left the force and left the job and became a builder. Uh, of course, as the son of a, for, of a immigrant, you are expected to work from the day you can walk. <laughs> and so I was working in construction and building since, I don't know, 11, 12 in, in some capacity, obviously not very productive as an 11 year old, but I, I was pushed hard. Uh, and with the education they afforded me, there are opportunities that come when you're in large scale building, but for example, uh, land opportunities that, that we took advantage of. And since it wasn't my father's bailiwick, he would say as a 15 year old, CJ, we have 500 acres in New Jersey, figure it out, which I did. And I met the Rockefeller Group, uh, wonderful people, and they are on an interesting path. And we together, uh, our first deal and my first foray into commercial real estate, 38 years approximately, it, it keeps changing every year. Uh, that number, unfortunately, in the wrong direction, uh, is to, is it was with the building the first international trade center, that's what it's called, in Mount Olive, New Jersey as a foreign trade zone, which has a lot of uh, value add tax benefits for manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one in this country, similar to an opportunity zone, by the way, very similar. Mm -hmm. It was actually the precursor to the legislation, which is one of the mm -hmm. reasons I became so involved with the writing with, uh, with uh, John Letiri, uh and, and, and the other co-founders and the legislators on crafting the opportunity zone uh, legislation because I w was involved in the early 80s in the foreign trade zone, which is very similar. 
So uh, from that, as I was just telling you uh, on our little lead up uh, or a little precursor, uh, I thought it was easy. I thought, wow, first out of the box, hit a grand slam. This has got to be the easiest career on the planet. I'll just keep doing this for the rest of my life. And then, of course, I realized it isn't. It's very hard. It's complex. Times change as they already have. Uh, you go through inflation, which, by the way, 40 years ago was the last time we had 8% plus inflation. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing this story full, you know, back full circle <laughs> to a memory that was my beginning, which now has a little resonance with where we are in an inflationary period. Very interesting. And, and, and I want to stop you there for a second. I want to provide some additional color and context to that very first deal you did. And, and maybe I, I don't think I grabbed your exact age when we had, you know, we were, we were chatting before we went live here, but you were a young fellow then. Tell me about yes. that. Yes. Yes. Uh, I met the rock pose when I was 15. They hung up the phone. I called them back <laughs> again and again and again. And then I mentioned, I sent the survey, which by the way, we actually sent by mail then. Imagine that. I, I got a nice big envelope. I put the survey in. I said, this highlighted area is ours. This is where you are. Maybe we should talk. And then they said, are you the 15-year-old who's been hounding our office? I'm like, yes, I am. And they're like, and you own all those land? I said, yes, we do. They said, yeah, you're right. We should talk. So and that's about how it the, began. So the, the vision here. Okay, let, I, again, 15, I, I get it. So you kind of grew up in the industry uh, for only for mm -hmm. a few years, though, right? I mean, there, there, I mean – there's not really much that you can absorb when you're 10, right? I mean, when, you, when, no. you, when you're in the family industry, right? And so 15, 14, 15, at that point in time, you're starting to get a general sense of what's going on, but probably don't really ha have a clue. You just don't, right? Even if no. you are the prodigy 15-year-old, which it sounds like you had some makings of that. And so with even with, even with all that being said, um, you know, your dad kind of saying, hey, go figure this out, CJ. Talk to me about those steps and we don't have to go too deep here, but I mean, I just, right. I think there's more to that story that, that folks can derive some, uh, you know, some, some insights from. So just where'd you go? What was the first step? What, sure. I mean, other than calling them, but why'd you call them? What was the reason? Okay. Called them? Well, one, the name two, okay. they were neighbors. And, and the earliest lesson I learned even before 15 was always look, if you're looking for expansion, look close, look next door. Mm -hmm. And they were next door. So I said, we have to monetize this large property, which had we had no plan for. There was no highest and best use, which you always should have. Mm -hmm. So ideally, what I learned was the, the greatest lesson I learned from that entire project, other than we did very well and it was great, was what not to do. Every mistake in the book. In fact, I often when I I also do a lot of venture capital investing and I look at founders and I and I look at their history, just like we're talking about now, their origin stories. And I say, how many failures and how many problems have you faced? Like, oh no, I, I had two big wins and they were great. I'm like, great. So you haven't had any challenges that you weren't sure how to overcome and then figured it out. That makes me nervous. So what that I learned is that you take a blank canvas, you come at it, you you pick the the path of least resistance and you start on it. And then when it doesn't work, you, you iterate, you find a way around that, that obstacle and you do it again and again and again. And if you keep doing the same mistake over again, maybe you should look for a new career. <laughs> uh, definition of insanity, but, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Definition of insanity. Uh, so that's what happened. And I'm so on one of those paths, uh, I, I found them and we started down the path. And by the way, getting entitlements for you know, wetlands of hundreds of acres on a brand new tax concept like the foreign trade zone, even with a group as as storied as Rockefeller Development Group uh, was then was many years, many, many years. In fact, I had a, a failed minor league professional hockey career in that interim mm. during before that actually came to fruition. Uh, in fact, that was easier than uh, <laughs> not making it to the NHL was easier yeah. than than bringing this home, this development. That's but what funny. but what it afforded me was a a college course in mm -hmm. in, in large scale development in, in yeah. industrial and logistics and its future. And more than anything, operating all of these things in a high inflationary environment, yeah. which for us thought was going to go on forever. We never thought that Paul Volcker would actually crush the back of inflation. But he did. So talk to me he about some of the, hated for it. Yeah, the similarities. Maybe maybe, you know, maybe some strategy behind uh, operating in that type of inflationary environment envi environment back then, and compare it to where it's at today. Maybe some strategy strategy you guys have put into place or implement in your business, um, just from pure experience that you dealt with back then. 
Well, yeah, that's good. So I, I try, I, I have actually been mining all of those memories. And unfortunately, those memories are fading a bit given my age. But uh, because we are in the same time, and I was speaking to someone, there's an entire generation, in fact, probably 1.75 generations uh, that have never experienced what we are going through. Now, I take heart in that because I have the experience. And as a very ultra competitive individual, I'm saying, well, if I'm competing against all these 30 year olds and they don't know the playbook, I'm going to win. <laughs> and that's the way I look at it. Uh, and so I've been looking back on those days. And I said, OK, development was interesting because we had a multi year, if not a five to seven year million square foot development that we had to project what tenancy and inflation and also build rates were going to be over three phases of a million square foot development. That's very hard yeah. when you're in a rising inflationary environment because your costs on day one are very different than your costs on day 500, right? But it's still part of the same IRR. So what we had to do was to speak to tenants early. And, and again, this is where the Rockefeller group came in great benefit because they said, all right, CG, we have no idea who you are, but Rockefeller, we know that name. And if they're asking us to bet on them and you, on a three years from now, we're going to do that. And I said, great. They said, now you're going to give us a discount for that bet. And I said, great. Uh, and we did. So what we did, what we look, my, I think my greatest lesson from that is don't go for the last dollar in an inflationary environment. Mm -hmm. Go for stability. Go for the bird in hand, whatever cliche you want to use. And then keep a portion of it for that high margin. So yeah. build the foundation first give up some of the IRR on that foundation, retain some if you're right, because that last 25, 30, 40%, whatever you, whatever the numbers pencil out at is going to provide the high margin of that yeah. IRR. But you have your foundation and you have your, you have your core costs mm -hmm. covered. No, fantastic. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. And so, you know, fat, let's fast forward to, to, to Noyak and, and, and more, more specifically, tell us, you know, who, what is Noyak, what it is you guys mm -hmm. specialize in and um, um, just exactly you know, what you're working on today. Great. So uh, since that first early Genesis story, I, I basically invested for a group of billionaire families uh, in my core competency, which is commercial real estate, specifically logistics, medical, and all of those asset classes. I want to talk about the actual definitions because I, I take, I have always wondered why anyone calls these alternative asset classes. I call them essential need critical use mm -hmm. uh, real estate. I don't understand the idea of all, by the way, I love manufactured housing. And if I had any experience and I'd be in it today uh, and I've been pitched so many times and I said, <laughs> until I learn more about it, I can't answer your pitch, but I love it. Uh, I, I understand enough of the core fundamentals. So I, I, I invested as a CIO of a large multifamily office. And then during COVID, a couple of our founding uh, principles passed away, not mm -hmm. from COVID. Apparently you have to say that. Uh, not from COVID. And that started a transition uh, for me. And I said, what is my next chapter of life as a as an older father of two boys under three? And that is legacy. And the legacy is taking skill sets that I've honed as a CIO in many asset classes, specifically commercial, over three decades to bring it to the widest possible audience. And that's what Noya Capital is. Noya Capital is taking the small circle of exclusive private investment access reversing it and bringing that world-class thing. I'm, I'm going to be arrogant and saying world-class expertise to the widest audience instead of the most exclusive. So I, I call it main street, not wall street, mm -hmm. right? The aspirational investor today, technology allows us, there's a technology and legal enablement to do it effectively. Yep. Never has before. This is the, the literally the nexus of a time when this is able and it has never been before. So that is what Noyak Capital is doing. We bring world-class asset, uh, asset management expertise and venture capital, obviously commercial real estate, um, uh, private durational credit, uh, consumer packaged goods to the aspirational investor. That's what we are. We're starting with a REIT. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a REIT for both the credit investors, obviously, which is a regulation D construction, as well as the non-accredited investor, regulation A construction. Together, they co-invest at the asset level, and it, together, it's a $200 million entity. And the skills we're bringing to bear are in the 
so-called alternatives, the critical need uh, um, commercial real estate, underpinning the digitization of our economy, our retail economy, our e-commerce economy. E-commerce is still, even with, I'd say, a little bit of its maturation, its life cycle, accelerating at a 5x pace. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure needed to support all of that, especially cold storage, the cold chain, is less than 3x that meaning there is a 3x demand supply imbalance mm -hmm. and it's continuing. Now it's not increasing year over year, but it's still continuing far apace. So there, there are years when we're not going to be able to fill the need for cold storage, dry warehouse, um, uh, last mile fulfillment, healthcare buildings, and our research and development or life science buildings. No, that's great. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. So just, just to give clarity there, um, right now we're seeing about a 5X growth rate uh, in, in the e-commerce. I think you made, you made reference to cold storage, but currently the actual, uh, you know, the actual supply of, of, of available buildings or properties to facilitate that are only growing at less than a 3X. So there's, yes. a, there's a fairly significant delta there. What what is the projected growth of 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 the you know e-commerce space over the next decade? I mean, is it you said it it probably won't continue at that five x year after year, and so no. What does that overall trajectory look like? At least if we could you know encapsulate that in like a, a decade or ten year span. Okay, well, I mean, it, it depends on the metric whether you're talking in in trillions of dollars or in year over year growth. The year over year growth is slowing. That, and because it's it's a natural maturity, it's not slowing for any external force. I mean, there are some. Um, China being taken out of the equation, globalization mm -hmm. being reversed, onshoring. There's, there is a, there are a lot of uh, momentum forces in the economy today. However, there's just more people already doing it. There, we already have some adoption, so we're way past early adoption. We're now into the maturation, and for me, that means that all of the low hanging fruit on what digitization brought to this country has been yielded yeah so what we're now looking at is how do you bring productivity to this maturing e-commerce for me that require that means the supply chain bringing it to your home faster for example i'll give a real-time example um a lot of people there's an organic wellness movement organic food mm -hmm. uh farm to table pretty well-known movement well you can't have farm to table to a large to a real population of new york city austin Boston, Seattle, uh, at Los Angeles, et cetera, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, without having being able to deliver that in the same day, because those are the promises made as, as people try and differentiate themselves in e-commerce, same day without having that produce in a cold chain storage within 30 minutes of the bell curve of that population. So it has to get to your house within 30, 45 minutes, staying cold the whole time, stored and there are no farms in new york city within 30 minutes right mm -hmm. so it has to go to an intermediate space then get to your home within 45 minutes before it spoils all of that has to stay cold well all of that to do it to a large population requires space infrastructure systems and engineering mm -hmm. and if this movement is going to increase which it is as a wellness movement for a, in a lifestyle especially post covid with all of our concerns about health our infrastructure has to improve dramatically and increase dry warehouse is different that's an example of the cold supply chain and what could happen with uh, uh, even as parts of the digitization i call digitization for example Cold storage is part of that e-commerce, meaning you order your food from Whole Foods and you say, I want it today. You ordered it online. You never went to the store. You never left your house. Mm -hmm. That's e-commerce. To do that at scale, we have to change our entire cold storage supply chain in this country entirely, triple it, and do it within a year. That's not going to happen, of course. <laughs> but the efforts to move in that direction yeah. are going to bring those early big returns I mentioned from the beginning of digitization of our e-commerce well now that is being brought to the cold storage there are million square foot warehouses there are manufacturing all of that exists so dry warehousing is further along the life cycle of maturity cold storage is earlier in the innings healthcare and life sciences i'd say life sciences on the earlier side healthcare 
is a little bit towards maturity. Yeah. But dry warehouse is the most mature. How do I know that? Well, all of the alternative investment firms, Apollo, Aries, Blackstone, of course, Harrison Street, uh, uh, PGM, et cetera, et cetera. All of their sovereign wealth investors said during COVID, the U.S. Treasury bond is yielding 0%. The German bond is yielding negative 25, meaning I have to give them 25 cents for every dollar I give them. I can't, I'm not going to do that. Where do I get yield? Oh, Blackstone, you invest in these giant boxes and they yield three, four, five percent maybe if I'm lucky. And there's a little bit of risk because, you know, warehousing, of course, there's no risk. Well, let's do that. And then they did that. And I've never seen, I've never seen velocity in like I saw in 2020, early 2020 through 2020, early 2022 mm -hmm. this year. Then the treasury went up to 4% as it is now. The yield right now is at 4.1%. And all of those sovereign wealth funds in Singapore, Temsec, and Germany, and all that, they call up Blacks and they said, guess what? I have a place to put all those billions of dollars, and it's called the U.S. Treasury, with no risk. So those boxes, get me out. And no one, no one forgot to tell them that when you get into a giant million square foot warehouse, you don't get it out the same day. But that's what's <laughs> happening right now. I have never seen, the same way I've never seen as much the price go up and the, and the velocity happen. I've never seen it reverse so fast. And that's what's happening right now. That's what can happen with low barrier to entry dry warehouse. You cannot do any of that with cold storage. Yeah, it requires expertise and management. That so they, talk, that, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to ask what, what, what role at this point, like what, what is Noyak, what role are you playing to, uh, to take advantage or, you know, to seize that opportunity in the cold storage space? Well, buying at the highest price and going into a bid is not what I call really a no, value add. No. Yeah, I, I call that lemmings. So, uh, you know, the people who follow each other off the cliff. Is there readaptive um, uses of some of this uh, dry storage into cold storage? No, no, okay. no. Dry storage is not. It, 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 well, yes, it, that is true. But the price that people think they should be getting for dry, for dry warehouse is never going to lend itself to Understood. opportunity to repurpose. So when you're repurposing, the easiest way right to do now to turn dry into cold is take a big box and make it a smaller big box, right? So for example, I'll give you a real-time example. We are buying, I uh, probably, eh, that's all right. I, I, I think I can still win. We're buying Sears. Sears went bankrupt, right? There's a lot of big box Sears. No one wants them. They're pretty cheap. If you know what you're doing and if you have the expertise, you can turn a big box, empty Sears, former Sears, formerly Sears building into an excellent, well-located cold storage facility. Mm -hmm. That is an idea that takes experience, expertise, networks, because you have to know the proper engineers, the foundational engineers, because if you try and do super cold, you'll crack your foundation and there goes your entire building. Not many people know that when they sit in Midtown and never leave their building, Midtown Manhattan, i.e. Sure. Blackstone. So um, <laughs> these are things that we're doing. We're looking at repurposing. Parking garages. I don't know if if we mentioned that in the in the uh, in the intro, but we're, I love we, parking garages. We we own parking garages. We love. I garages. love them too. <laughs> what happens when people stop parking? Yeah. What are they then? They're <laughs> wonderful, low, well located, mm -hmm. giant, uh, giant buildings for re, for adaptive reuse, and those are going to be the fulfillment centers. In fact, we branded it Next Mile. It's almost like the seven minute abs. Six minute yeah. abs are better. So the next mile fulfillment center are going to come from well-located downtown large parking garages. We're mm -hmm. going to put cold storage pods for that, that Whole Foods, uh, that Whole Foods uh, artisanal grocery on the top floor. We're going to then put EV charging for fleets like Amazon, et cetera, and Hertz on the next floor. We're going to do co-warehousing for small business operators on the floor below that. And then the two bottom floors are going to accommodate the, what's left over from our post-COVID 30% parking demand. I love it. I love it. Do you see, are, are there any um, readaptive use projects happening in the, in the parking sector? And I, I don't know the, I'm asking that because I, I have not heard of any, not to the extent of what you just described there, I have not heard of any projects such as that uh, already taking place. Uh, have you seen anything like that across the country yet? I have. It's this little firm. They're small but mighty called Noyak. Uh, they're doing okay. one in Columbus. Well, there we go. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So bad dad joke, but yes, uh, we're doing one in Columbus. It's, and okay. by the way, we've also brand, we call it a mobility hub. And the reason mm-hmm. we call it a mobility hub is because it, it takes into place that you're accommodating mobi- you know, mobility solutions, mobile solutions for logistics. And mm-hmm. that's, that's going to be the first leg of the adaptive reuse is, as I said, uh, fleets, fleet storage for logistics. Um, actually, We've had conversations with the with the drone delivery companies because, again, we have a lot of large garages with giant top floors rooftops, that yeah. drones can land with rooftops that drones can land. And then the the vans, the low cube vans that are on the floor right below it will take those deliveries and bring them to the homeowner within a few miles, uh, lowering our carbon footprint along the way, which makes it an impact and a sustainability investment. So yes, we're doing a large, we have a 1200 car garage in downtown Columbus, Mm -hmm. Ohio, one of my favorite tier two markets, by the way. Uh, And we're doing one there. I do know of some that are doing co-warehousing in New York City. The problem with that is, there's not a problem, but the difference is that these are underneath large towers. And it's very restrictive when you don't have a full structured parking facility Mm -hmm. and you're part of another building, which has a lot of competing agendas. So I don't do that. Um, I, I think that's uh, a, a tougher, and I'm not so sure about its long term. But if you have a long, t- if you have a giant parking garage that's well located and it's operating at 25 percent capacity post COVID with your parking, well, that is a prime that is a prime um, suspect for uh, to become a mobility hub and do next mile fulfillment. I'm assuming there could be some great opportunities here coming uh, in the next couple of years in some of these uh, in, in some of these larger cities, such as a Columbus that. Um, you know, you know, where the all and, and we, we have yet to see how the you know how the office sector how it really plays out over the next three, four, five, seven years, right? And uh, I think we can all agree that there's going to be a slight shift, right? It's going to be market by market, you know, employer by employer of, of what the requirements are of getting the workforce back in. Is it bigger workspaces? Are they taking less square footage? Right? There's there's all these variables here that we just don't know exactly how they will all play out, but we do know that there's a lot of these, you know, uh, you know, tall structures that were built, you know, office structures that were built, you know, 30, 40 years ago also came with a fairly significant parking component. A lot of times it's a detached, but attached, you know, by some type of breezeway or walkway uh, parking facility. Do you see there being opportunities there, not necessarily just for the, you know, readaptive use of an office, maybe into a multifamily or some other type of project, but again, more specifically to the parking um, component of it? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the concept of parking is changing dramatically. Is there a five year we're all doing a driverless EV? No, of course not. Yeah, no. It, it, it's always there's always hype at the front end of every new mm-hmm. movement. Does the paradigm shift have real legs? Yes, it does. No one, if they do, can tell you exactly when it's going to become adopted. That they should they should just uh, they should just pick lottery tickets because they'll be they'll be a billionaire overnight. Um, it is going to happen. I think the most interesting conversations I've had in the last 18 months are with architects. Talking to architects about what's going to happen to those buildings have been, uh, I, I can only remember, I remember a movement when, when you know, the, the early, the first dot-com craze, 96 to 2001. Um, that was the last time I had as much fun talking to architects because remember, it went from cubicles and all these first to open floor plates. Yeah co-working style all these ideas and they were great ideas until no one wanted to fund dot-com companies but the ideas that were born from that movement in um in space planning in architecture they lasted and they they were revolutionary and we're in that moment again we're in a shift on what to do with real estate that now has to take into account carbon footprint sustainability and general esg principles for the buildings the owners Mm -hmm. of the buildings as well as the tenants right so you put all this, these ideas together and they are going to change dramatically. I am not going to pretend I know where they're going to end up. The Which, parking garages all are obviously, to get to the, the real point of your question, is all of those are going to be candidates to do what I, I think uh, is going to happen, which is how do we lower our carbon footprint, improve our supply chains, several, mm-hmm. cold, dry, last mile or next mile fulfillment, how do we do that in the most efficient way? And how do we repurpose underutilized real estate to do that? And mm-hmm. what you just described is going to be one of the ways they do that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. 
I would love to garner any insights that you that you've had from some of those conversations with architects about you know th- th- more specific to the office, you know, to, to, to these office buildings that you know will will have been or will be suffering uh, here in the coming years, and what what are some of these. Uh, you know, I guess uh, uh, readaptive uses that that might be spawned out of you know a, a post COVID environment. Well, I, I it, it, they're they're <laughs> they're complicated and nuanced, yeah. but I'll give you one what I think is one key takeaway thus far, and they're evolving. Of course, this is uh, sure you know, sure. CNBC asks, "Are is anyone ever going back to the office?" They're always asking that every day. Um, here's the one takeaway I have: anyone who thinks that any large property is single use we feel that they are going to be myopic. They're going to be mm-hmm. wrong. Anything that is truly single use, like this is a class A office building and nothing else. That is not going to be, is not going to have a long-term prospects. Mm-hmm. So those with those single use, and that, and that goes across, not just office, a parking garage is essentially a single use. Mm-hmm. You go and you park cars. We're, we're moving in that direction with the mobility of making it multi-purpose, multi-purpose for what, humans and our infrastructure require at that moment. For example, I'll give you yet another 5G. Well, there's not a lot of space on any of these buildings to put the the type of tower and infrastructure necessary to make 5G a reality. Everyone thinks 5G just happens because it, there's a little number and a letter on your phone. No, it doesn't. It does not. It requires infrastructure that doesn't exist. One of the reasons Verizon and AT&T are so slow to roll out it's because they have the, 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 the technology, but the infrastructure does not. So I think that you're going to see buildings and parking garages accommodating the 5G rollout as well. Another use, an, another multi-purpose. Mm-hmm. So I think any, any type of large-scale real estate that thinks it, it does one thing, better think again. Yeah. I love it. I love it. CJ, this has been a lot of fun and very insightful. Really appreciate you coming to the show. For those that want to learn more about you and Noyak and, 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 and the different offerings that you have available, where's the best place to find you? Uh, Noyak, spelled N-O-Y-A-C-K above my mm-hmm. head, NoyakLogistics.com. That is our current offering. Mm-hmm. We are in, I'm not going to send you to the Noyak Capital because we're going to debut something pretty interesting in about two months which is going to be free and a, and, a, and called Noyak Investing Club. So it's going to be give, doing just what Kevin does, is to provide free ideas and actionable advice and expertise, and then to empower the aspirational investor to take control of their private investments. So right now, noyaklogistics.com, and you can speak to us, and we'd love to talk more about critical need infrastructure and how to invest in it and bet on the American supply chain. Fantastic. Guys, I'll put that in the show notes. CJ, again, thanks for joining us here today. Hey, Kevin, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for inviting me. Real pleasure. All righty, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin, but wishing you huge success. Take care.